about PTSD in multicultural situations. Welcome also Jan and Joop, our speakers. I'm going to introduce you later on. Uh, first, have a, a short introduction with regards to the topic. Uh, we all know how difficult it sometimes is to understand people with a different cultural background. We already have that in, in small, just to put on the television nowadays and watch CNN reporting about the presidential elections in the United States to understand how much we actually don't understand. And I must say after two nights of non-sleep, I almost need some advice from you, Jan and Joop, <laughs> uh, about the PTSD. But let's not talk about that <laughs> at this moment. Our guests are going to tell you more about the subject of PTSD connected to crisis and war situations, so that's something else than presidential elections, and the problems that, for instance, refugees face integrating in a new country after fleeing their homeland. Uh, I am Marduka Christensen. I'm going to be your host tonight and the moderator of this lecture. Before uh, introducing the two speakers of tonight, I uh, need to explain some of the practicalities because not everyone is used to online conference, uh, conferences like this. Eh? This is thanks to COVID that we learn uh, more and more how to do this. Very convenient. Um, our both, uh, the two speakers both have lectures prepared and a PowerPoint presentation. Everyone has been put on mute. Uh, after the lectures, there will be a small discussion between the two uh, 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 men that you see here, the two speakers, and there is um, a space to ask questions. I will gather the questions in the Q&A. So um, there is a small button below or up, it depends on your computer with Q&A where you can uh, uh, ask the questions and then I will make sure that they are asked to the two speakers of tonight. And please do not hesitate to ask questions because I really want to do something. And uh, that keeps, keeps me busy too. Okay, uh, what are we going to do? We hope that uh, we are ready around uh, 21, 21, 15, 9 o'clock, around 9 o'clock, so then we can look at the results of the elections, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we start with Jan. Jan is going to have a lecture of 20 minutes. After that, uh, Joop will have his lecture and presentation. Uh, then um, at 2045, we will have a, a discussion and I will ask the questions. Okay, and then now I'm going to introduce the two speakers to you. I will have a small note because it is a, a, a good, a thorough story. It is Professor Dr. Joop de Jong. Uh, he is MD, PhD psychiatrist and psychotherapist. He is Emeritus Professor of Cultural Psychiatry and Global Mental Health at UMC Amsterdam, adjunct professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine, and Emeritus Visiting Professor of Psychology at Rhodes University, South Africa. He was the founder and director of the Transcultural Psychosocial organization, the TPO, which provided sustainable mental health and psychosocial services, especially in post-war and post-disaster areas in more than 20 countries in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Joop de Jong worked part-time as a psychotherapist and psychiatrist with immigrants and refugees in the Netherlands. He has been integrating insights from public and global mental health, psychotherapy, psychiatry, um, psychiatry, anthropology, and epidemiology. <laughs> that is a different word. <laughs> In community interventions, on which he co authored 330 papers, chapters, and books. Welcome, Joop. 
A very good Thank to you have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Then uh, there will be our first speaker, that is Professor Dr. Jan uh, Kisselam. Uh, he is an internationally well-recognized psychologist, social, uh, uh, sociologist, orientalist, in the head of the Institute for Transcultural Health Science State University in Germany. He is sought-after expert in transcultural psychiatry and trauma and is Dean at the Institute for Psychotherapy and Psychotraumatology at the University of the Hoop in, in Iraq. So you're switching a little bit between countries, as I understand. And you're now in Germany because your internet is really good. And you're head of department at the Mediclin Clinic, as I understood. For over 20 years, you have been researching topics such as migration and PTSD. You have developed a several therapy concepts and continue to consult many governmental and non-governmental institutions. So as we say in the Netherlands, this is really a mouthful. So very experienced people on the topic. So we very much look forward to your lectures. Uh, can I give you the first uh, stick, as we say in the Netherlands, and <laughs> give the stick to you. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much for the introduction. I really appreciate it to be today with you. And um, thanks to all for this huge organization, which is not easy in this day. Yes, we are all looking on the overseat and uh, hopefully the right president will win in the next couple of hours. Um, uh, First, I will, of course, thank uh, Professor Job de Jong. Um, he's one of the most important uh, figures in the transcultural psychiatry and psychotherapy, and one of the pioneers in this work. So it's, uh, thank you already uh, at this point for your really uh, pioneering work. So it's a great honor to be uh, with you today, and I'm very curious to hear and discuss with you later. Uh, I will start with my PowerPoint. I hope it's all working. Uh, let's see. I hope everyone is able to see that. Yes. Uh, first, I would like to give a short introduction why a transcultural aspect of PDSD is important. Uh, just if you look in 2019, the United Nations registered more than 70 million people who had been forcibly displaced. Uh, of these, uh, more than five to 25 million people were classified as refugees uh, who had been forced to leave the homeland and, um, of course, for persecution, war, torture, violence, and other unbelievable issues. Uh, just maybe let give me um, an example of Iraq where I'm working. You mentioned it already. Um, in Iraq, since the IS 2014 came to Syria and Iraq um, and overrun these areas, the use of brutality, especially towards long established people, religion minorities like Yazidis, Yarasan, but also Shias, Mandeas, and other minorities. So, huge number were actually executed, thousands of human and uh, children, women were enslaved and uh, kidnapped. Um, thousands of Yazidi women and other uh, Christian women uh, were raped and still we uh, missed about 2,800 people. We don't know where they are, even the IS don't control any of this region, but uh, we don't know uh, they missed. Uh, this situation, of course, led massive movement of refugee in Syria, Iraq, Turkey and Iraq, just uh, in, uh, in Duhok, where I'm working at the university with my students. Uh, in the refugee camps, uh, still there are 300, uh, 350,000 refugees in ID camps and different um, 22 different uh, camps. Besides the IDPs, uh, there are more than 20,000 uh, refugees from uh, Syria who are also uh, living under very uh, circumstance, bad circumstances. After the COVID-19, we did some researches and it shows really in the refugee camps uh, like depression, um, uh, PTSD, and another psychological disorder arise about 20%. So 
uh, you know, the medical situation in this area is very, uh, very difficult. Even in, in Dohuk, when we're working with about 1 million person in the city, we just have 26 uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychotherapists, five psychiatrists, and one hospital. Even uh, if the COVID will arise, and it shows it will arise, it will be really difficult uh, situations. That means we know that those experience of violence and torture can increase the risk of developing of mental disorder, especially affective and post-traumatic disorder. Uh, why, with this introduction, so I would like um, to point out the importance of mental illness, especially PTSD, and argue that it requires a different understanding when it's come to treating people from other cultures than in Western countries. Uh, I'm sure you will go uh, more deeper in this uh, issue, especially when it's come to victims, and I call them more, I like to call them survivors, survivors of war, because victim is something uh, more negative, uh, associated negative. They are survivors because they were fighting, uh, they were kidnapped, they were in captivity. So they are survivors of, of terror. Uh, and this will also, and this will one another topic, uh, what's about the transgeneration traumata like uh, minorities that I'm working with them in the Middle East. Uh, some of this like the diseases face now about 800 years, 72 to 74 genocides. And this is very important what has happened to the next generation after a genocide, how it's uh, epigenetically, but also uh, psychologically some disorders, behaviors, cognition, and motivation is passed from one generation to another generation. Let me say this very clear, Iraq and Syria is just one example. Uh, if you look on the crisis worldwide, there are so many crises worldwide now, and even every country like in Africa, Asia, or Middle East. Um, so the, the issue is, of course, transcultural psychiatry and psychotherapy. So you can you see my understanding of uh, transcultural psychiatry and psychotherapy. So in order to treat people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and who came from other cultures, cultural and social political aspect as well, the understanding of processing illness, uh, disease must taken in my opinion account. In addition, the acceptance of Western idea of trauma therapy sometimes not working in, in Middle East or in the, another area where I'm, I'm working. So we have maybe find a new approach and different approach. For example, the relationship with patient and doctors is sometimes different. The perception of illness and uh, coping strategies uh, are different, especially in the last, ten, uh, the last uh, six years I'm working with more than 2,400 women uh, were raped by the IS. The sexual gender specific situation is also very important and how they are able to cope with this. Of course, I will just give you some inputs. I, we will be not able to cover all issues and topics of um, transcultural psychiatry and the importance and impact for PTSD, uh, but just maybe give you some, some ideas uh, of my understanding why it's important to go beyond uh, the psychotherapy that we are using in the Western world. Um, one idea is maybe this, uh, this theory of Leventhal, theory in the 1918s, for example. He, it's assumed that uh, in the case of mental illness in the context of cultural biographies, for example, and self symptoms develops as illness uh, in the case of subjective disease theory, cognitive, and also in emotion. That means before Freud, Jung, and another uh, or historical um, psychiatrists and psychotherapists, uh, people in crisis found somehow to deal with crisis, with catastrophes. And this means they have in their cultures some coping strategies, which is important. And this is one topic of my, my, my working, the transcultural health side, to find ways and understand how culture, how religion uh, adopts this in the modern way of psychiatry and psychotherapy. Um, of course, uh, the issue is 
to ask some question about what we mean with pathogenesis. It's really every culture has the same diseases. It's like same, or we have a different way to show this. And uh, what role um, is the protection culture? Is culture a protection? Or is culture maybe a burden? It depends on, on individual. If we uh, look on the gender specific issues from about women who are living in Islam or radical organization and uh, dictatorships, are they really free? Are they able to be able as a human and the human right perspectives or are they have more burden and what is a different uh, way to deal maybe with PDST? So there are different strategies uh, and those are some questions that we, do, uh, we have to ask us if we are working with people from different kinds of cultures or backgrounds of cultures. Uh, so the transcultural aspects actually of, of PDSD in my understanding, and sometimes we mentioned this also as culture sensitive uh, psychotraumatology means assuming an uh, uh, empathic and non judgmental attitude, trying to understand each individual cultural background which is not always easy since the transmission and counter transmission, we consciously and unconsciously bring in our culture understanding. So as a Western therapist, uh, just a question, I really am able to understand how it feel to be a nine years old Yazidi girl who was 10 months in the hand of IS and raped hundreds of times by all the men. Can really we understand, can we have enough empathic. Uh, this is the same question to the Holocaust. Can you really understand what it's mean uh, to be a survivor of a Holocaust or to be in the cassettes in this uh, Nazi regime's uh, camps? So it's sometimes limited to understand. And if they came from different kinds of cultures, maybe also it's uh, difficult. Therefore, a carefully uh, individualized psychoeducation maybe as a bridge between the worldview uh, of the patient and the evidence-based tools that we are working as scientists and um, as, a, as a psychotherapist. Another important issue, which is also very important and touch me every time when I talk to treat uh, and talk and treat um, patients and survivors of sexual violation. Uh, I'm confronted always um, uh, with war crisis region, with a symptom symptomatic and really unbelievable sexual violation against girls and women. And this is systematically, this is not just one cases or two cases. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, when we uh, go around the, uh, around the countries and the world. Therefore, from a mental health as well, from the human right perspective, it is really necessary to address sexual violence even in traditional different societies which sometimes is avoided to talk about them. Uh, they are not really for a shame, the case of honor. Uh, yes, sometimes culture is an important factor uh, that has always right to be considered in a treatment programming, but culture is not always helpful. This is also, we have to know this, not just to be blind and everything, what we understand is culture is uh, positive, is helpful. Culture and religion can protect and give orientation, yes. But if they became dogmas and uh, an ideology, then even these cultures and religion can kill people. So there is also a limit of understanding. And um, when we are facing this terror actions in the last uh, two months, so we can see how ideology is transfer and became people blind and are able to kill another people. So only when we, only uh, when they serve as a therapeutic resource, culture and religion, then, then they can be, in my opinion, effectful. Uh, just give you here an example of Yasmin. Um, uh, she was 16 years old when she was taken um, by the IS in, uh, in captivity. And after her liberation, uh, she told me she woke up at night and worried that uh, ES terrorists could return and rape her again. Uh, she got up, sprinkled her face with food and set her in uh, fire to herself. Um, she survived and she's now living in Germany. We uh, take them with a special program 
with uh, another 1,100 survivors of IS to Germany for treatment. She uh, uh, already had more than 40 operations, surgeon's operation and hand and skin. Uh, she is well, but she is of course affected and for the whole life. And she told me and culture, culture is something that's very powerful. And I, I, I asked her, why, why did you say this? Because it's so awful. And she said, if I'm ugly, they will not hurt me again. And it shows the case of shame and culture. It looks uh, very important. This is just to show you very briefly uh, uh, the relation, the impact of shame, dissociation, uh, and somatoform disorders, pain, body pain especially, it shows it's, uh, it's linked very um, close to each other. So this, our studies uh, of dissociative CCS and the correlation among traumatized female Yazidis with experience of sexual violence uh, provides additional evidence that dissociative disorders and chases are strongly connected with trauma events, especially rape in IS captivity, the relation to shame, which further adds a high psychosocial pressure and the connection with self mental disorder like somatization disorder. Uh, and this and somatization disorder, as you can see, is very high, PTSD, uh, but also dissociation disorder, which we observed also by the 1,100 women we take to Germany and also the same um, shows in Canada, they also take 1,400 persons and they, uh, we talk and they, it's not normal. So the, the prevalence of dissociation in this case is very high and this looks like it's something with linked with the culture and culture of uh, shame. Uh, this is just another case which you can see, um, especially uh, women, uh, numerous, uh, they have uh, numerous um, physical complaints, diseases, stomach pain, headache, sweetie, palpation, muscle pain, uh, because in some uh, traditional cultures, they don't know psychologists and they don't know psychotherapists. And uh, sometimes they don't believe that it will be work if you just talk to them. They believe in the old idea of a doctor, we give a medicine and something with the medicine will magic and there will be not any more su suffer uh, from this uh, psychological disorder. So um, therefore the psychoeducation really in this case is very important to give him the main information why they have a PTSD and how it's possible even through talking and quotation, uh, we can find some ways that you will be able to uh, to deal with this. Uh, my approach of PTSD uh, in general is not something do magically, uh, more to able give with some techniques with the relationship and with uh, PTSD trauma treatment that the patient will be able to control the symptoms. Uh, they will be able to control the uh, the nightmares, sleeping disorders, uh, the fears, anxieties, and depression, and find a way to deal with them for perspective, for better perspective. But they will be not able to forget it. We cannot do that. They can learn to control and to live with this trauma. This trauma will remain. This is uh, very clear. But uh, with our um, psychotherapy techniques and methods, well, we are able to, uh, to, to help them. And one case is, of course, we have to mention the situation of children who face uh, the war, especially child soldiers. Uh, you can see this here with Yazidis and non-Yazidis who were uh, forced to join the IS, for example, and even depression, PTSD, and self-esteem is uh, differ from person who are not attend to, um, uh, to this uh, military groups and trained by, the, by them. That means also in the same time, we have to adopt the culture sensitive approach and we need long terms of psychotherapy interdisciplinary with social workers, with psychotherapists, with teachers. Uh, so I'm working with some of the child soldiers in Iraq and with some, with some NGOs 
and they have some short concepts of six months and this is really not enough at least to my experiences we need more than three years to be with the children because they lost hope and they lost the trust and confidence in human and in humanity so we have to do for long term to win the heart of the children and uh, to um, to be able they they believe yes there is a right world and there are people i can trust and have a better perspective and um, my last issue or this um, one of the last is a transgeneration trauma I'll just give you an example on the yazidis so we are talking about three different types of trauma which is not do more a lot of um, uh, this time uh, a lot of studies is exist so we have some psychoanalytic uh, ideas and models uh, in the 15th and 16th uh, but uh, just give you an example of the minorities in middle east uh, they, as I mentioned, they faced transgeneration trauma because their ancestors already faced many, many traumatas and genocides. And uh, if you give the example of the Yazidis on the 3rd of August on 2014, all Yazidis faced a collective trauma because the uh, IS uh, aimed to destroy the society. So it's what, not just an individual issue. So we have a collective trauma, we have a trans historical trauma, and of course, at the same time, the individual trauma, everyone is faced their own pain, which is uh, uh, not easy. And this has happened to the Oriental Christians, the Mandeas, and other organizations. This is just a model to, to show you how we understand transgeneration trauma and how we uh, may able to adapt this in the modern way of psychotherapy Otherwise, we can reduce the symptoms. But if you don't take account the trauma, the transgenerational trauma of, of the society, uh, I, I promise you after six months, they will come with a different kind of symptoms. So it will be not reduced. So we have to go more deeper and understand what the uh, further generations, the ancestors give them in behavior and cognition uh, in different kinds of emotions, uh, for, uh, for example, this is also very important. The last one maybe is the significance of justice. So many can ask what is just, why justice? We are not lawyers, uh, but there is kind of injustice against a group, against a minority. And they're always a question they ask me why it's happened to us and how we can find some perspective and belief in this country, but also in the humanity to have a justice. So uh, a topic that has been paid little attention, in my opinion, in psychotherapy so far is in my view, justice, in particular in the aftermath of crime against crime against humanity is one, uh, human rights, violence, second, and genocide. The question, the question arises whether and how justice really can be restored. Yet if war is a negative impact on health, uh, so we need some programs to talk about um, um, negative impacts and how it's, um, we can find a way in the psychotherapy to live with this unjustness or to develop uh, different ideas. Yes, we can individual as and collective uh, to live with kind of injustice that's happened to us. So uh, human rights uh, and health cannot be separated uh, in psychotherapy with survivors of war and terror. Based on um, ethical principle, new approaches must be generated for psychotherapy in war region and with survivors of war and terror. The aim will be to make an important contribution uh, to the mental social reconstruction of the country after mass violence. If you are working as a psychotherapist in war region and post-war crisis, psychotherapy means at the same time to support the peace process because we teach them to learn not to be aggressive, not to kill someone, your enemy, to learn to deal with them peaceful, uh, to uh, be able again to live with you uh, neighbor, even he was one of the perpetrators or supported the perpetrators, which is not, not really easy. 
uh, came to the end. As a psychotherapist, I believe you must not only understand our patients and their um, burden, we must also understand uh, the reason of the violations that they face. For example, the ES called the Islamic State is not just a terror organization They tried to find a new ideology and it's like a fascist uh, totalitarian ideology that we face in the Nazi regime in Germany. This is also very important and this will be also uh, for the future a huge problem, not just for anti uh, de radicalization uh, and anti-terror organization, it will be also for us as psychotherapists very important. That means from my understanding that psychotherapists not only work in closed rooms uh, and are connected with a reduction, reduction of symptoms, psychotherapists are part of a society and have the responsibility and duty to respond to violence and abuse. Uh, violence is not isolated case. Violence came from the very heart of the society. This is very clear. And we as a psychotherapist must be at least open about treating people in war or post-conflict region with PTSD is not about learning a new form of psychotherapy. It is about registering and learning skills of culture sensitive psychotherapeutic treatment in general and especially behavior trauma therapy methods. Individual therapy is also about concentrating on people from different cultures with a different concept of illness and how to deal with them. So uh, in, in, in summary, there is no need to find new techniques. So the modern way of post-traumatic stress order and post-trauma treatment, it's fine, it's evidence-based but we have to find a way to adapt the culture as a resources to able to help a patient with a big, uh, different kind of uh, cultures. I will show you some pictures. Uh, this is one of the children we was faced, although was in AS captivity and uh, she had no hope and was sometimes not able for six months to talk to anyone after the psychotherapy in Iraq with my uh, team. She is now visiting a school, even a refugee camp. And um, I asked her, what do you want to be one day? And he showed to my, my, uh, my chair and he said to me, uh, I want to sit there one day there. I say, why? Uh, I want to be a doctor one day and help my people. And, this, and if she has hope, why we should lose our hope. So um, this is my, my message to you and generally and even Yasmin is now well, she's speaking very well, German, visiting a school, uh, and uh, she won't be a uh, one day study and want to be a lawyer. So she still has hope. And, and one of the most example, maybe you know Nadia Murat, the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2018. She's one of our patients we take from uh, Iraq to Germany. And after empowerment, she said, yes, I will stand up and fight for the right of my people and the right of, of the woman. And this is uh, what we can do sometimes with psychotherapy. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Jan. Very impressive. And also the ending was really impressive. Uh, we should never lose hope. And if Yasmin does not lose hope, then so, we should definitely not. Yes. Well, before I'm uh, asking a lot of questions, because I've written down a couple of questions my, uh, myself, I hope also that the public will ask some questions. Uh, I have not seen any questions appearing, but feel free to do that. I give uh, the word to Joop. Joop, welcome. Yes, hello, good evening. There it is. Yes. Good evening to all the people who attend. Thank you, Professor Kieselam, for your fantastic lecture. Just for those who are listening, I want to tell you that when we prepare this evening, Jaime and Maduka and 
Jan Kieselhaan and me and Remy and the others who have been helping, we wanted to try to give you two kind of complementary uh, topics. So Jan, he talked very much about the issues out there in the Middle East, which of course have a lot of overlap with what we see here in the West. He, he drew, drew the parallels with Nazism, etc. I'm going to focus a bit more on what happens when the people who are the survivors of those human rights violations, when they come to the West and what do they then go through? And that's the topic of my talk. Yo, I'm thought... sorry, but uh, we, we apparently don't see the presentation. Um, uh, I can see uh, one of the people in the audience saying that they uh, cannot see the full screen and I have the same thing. Well, then we need Remy to come in and help us. Um, sharing is Remy is there. I I can see it now. Uh, oh, it's fine. No, it's fine. Yes. It's absolutely fine. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry did, for the disturbance. Did, did you hear what I said so I can go on? There was just a screen missing. Okay, I hope that everybody is now seeing it. So uh, let me start with uh, this old Greek bandit Procrustes, who near Athens, he used to take people from the road and put them on a bed. And when their legs were, were too long, he would chop off their legs. And why is this myth of Procrustes still interesting and why am I using it today as a metaphor for a refugee problem? On the one hand, the myth of Procrustes is about one size fitting all. Procrustes, he was also the terrorist of all the latter. And there was total arbitrariness in what he did like terrorists do today. And his acts, they touch upon something that we find that very difficult when we talk about trauma and that Jan just mentioned already, is the question from why did this horrible thing happen to me or why did it happen to us? Which has to do with one of the things that's very fundamental in psychotherapy is that how do you help the person who's sitting there or how do you in a group work with people who are traumatized and help them to find the meaning to the event. But on the other hand, also, how do you deal with their anger and the other emotions? The myth of Procrustes also refers to another myth around asylum seekers and refugees. That is that we as a society in Europe and also here in Holland, and I think many things or more things that I say about Holland, it's about the same in Germany and other countries is that we have this belief in tailored care and equal access to care. And that again is a myth. I'll come back to Procrustes at the end. What's my talk about? I'm going to talk briefly about key social determinants. I'm going to give you a few epidemiological figures. I'm going to tell you something about the burden of arriving in a safe country, for example, in Europe. I tell you a bit about evidence-based treatments that we have and some recommendations for what we could do with the problem of refugees. Why would we address social determinants of mental health? One reason is that when you look at treatment figures and complex studies on the effect of psychotherapy, they show serious limitations, especially when it, it's about very traumatized populations. And we know that health and mental health is strongly influenced by social determinants like income, housing, etc. For example, if you look worldwide at the prevalence of postnatal common mental disorder, which is a high percentage of 20%, that is determined by unintended pregnancy, by lack of partner support, by poverty, by interpersonal violence. And those factors the increase in humanitarian emergencies and armed conflict. Um, 
When it comes to social determinants and profession, we also do have effective interventions. To give you a few examples, when it comes to domestic violence, uh, two studies in South Africa and Uganda show that about 50% of the violence can decrease with even quite short-term interventions. There's another good program about poverty alleviation. When you help people with cash, they can kind of come out of the vicious circle of poverty, alienation, trauma, stress, etc. So there is a reason to go more for prevention than we used to do in the past. Here I show you a couple of issues on the left hand, protective factors among youth, on the right hand, risk factors. And then here in blue, you see those aspects, those factors that we can address as a universal preventative intervention, meaning that's a cheap intervention that can help everybody. And on the left hand, you see social support, cohesion within the family, decent housing, presence and the well-being of parents, so family reunion, a school is important, and when there's a foster family, that the foster family has the same ethnic background. It's very important on the right hand that we prevent re-exposure after flight. I'll get back to that later. We don't expose these children to endless transfers from one place to another. Repeated migration, guest currency, discrimination, very low socioeconomic status of the family and no movement or sport. So these are things that are quite easy to address for all the asylum seekers and the refugees arriving in Europe. And then so we can uh, still see the only the first uh, slide. So the slide that you are talking about, we cannot see at the moment. Then I think that is is Remy still there? He is still there, I think. Yes. Do you now see now it? We can see it absolutely. Okay, do I, do I have to go back a few slides and go very brief over them? Maybe that is a good idea. Okay. Okay, so now my thing is blocked. And there's always the challenge with the uh, okay. computers. Yeah. Eh? Well, okay, so just to re resume, I said we could spend more time on prevention. I mentioned a couple of preventative programs in Africa, for example, on prevention of domestic violence, how that relates to all kinds of psychological problems or help people to alleviate their poverty. Then I said, there are a number of factors, risk factors on the right hand, protective factors on the left hand. The ones that are circled in blue are issues that we can solve for everybody who comes to Europe in terms of social support, decent housing, reunion, re reunion of the family, uh, positive school experience, uh, preventing re-exposure and transfer from one place to another, discrimination, poverty, and no movement of sport. And then there's for in terms of selective prevention, that's what we the term we use when people are at risk and we have focused intervention on those at risk people is for example, the children or the youth that are unaccompanied, uh, parents who are single, either father only or a mother who have to take care of the family. When there is psychopathology of the parents, as Jan just said, the intergener intergenerational transmission or transgenerational transmission of psychological problems is a big issue everywhere in the world where there's war and conflict. So you want to disrupt that cycle of transgenerational transmission. And then of course, nutritional deficiencies are important like also uh, communicable diseases like tuberculosis and other diseases. So let me give you very briefly a few epidemiological figures. Here you see the rates of the prevalence rates, the number of people from Syria in camp situations in Europe and elsewhere, camp and non-camp situations. 
And these are average figures of many studies. And then you see that about 30% of those people coming out of Syria, they suffer from a depression and about 30% also suffers from PTSD. And often that is comorbid as Jan already just said, meaning people, they suffer from one thing, but also from the other thing. That quite, quite a large group has problems with anxiety, with somatic pains, bodily pains, with substance abuse. And when you look at these figures that are huge, um, I mean, depression, let's say, on a one year based in Holland, a person has a chance of having a depression is about 7% and PTSD 3%. So these are huge figures. Only 8% of these people who have these psychological problems, they get a kind of a treatment in the West. That's not only the figure in Holland, that's a bit a European problem. And so you can wonder if there are so many people who have these problems, how is it possible that less than 10% of them gets treatment in our rich countries in Europe? And this is a bit of a complicated slide. I'm going to explain to you what it means. Here you see this column. And this means from there down up to here, you see that these are, this is a group of people population and they walk through the healthcare system and the first thing is that they have to see whether they have a problem so when they perceive a problem then the first step is and that's also the first filter is that they go to the doctor or they go not to the doctor whether they have COVID or depression and then they become part of the group of patients of that doctor but then the doctor he has to recognize those patients as having a problem, whether it's again COVID or depression or PTSD or cancer. And there already something goes wrong. And that's what you see in this red circle. Because the GP, the huisarts, recognizes in about one of two Dutch patients that he or she has a psychological problem. But when it comes to refugees, the huisarts only recognizes one in six. And when it comes, and why is that so? Well, one of the reasons is that the refugee or the asylum seeker, he may present his problems in a cultural way. He may use what we call an idiom of distress. So he may say, doctor, I have a crumbling heart, which is something that Syrians may complain about. Or we know many of these idioms of distress among Afghani, Syrians, and other refugees, they may say, I can't swallow. And the doctor may not ask what's behind those complaints. Or people complain of pain, as Jan already just mentioned. And then the doctor, again, doesn't continue to ask. And then among Dutch patients, the GP refers one and three to the mental health services, but in refugees, only one and nine. That's not only the problem of the doctor, that's also a problem of the refugee because a refugee in Holland, refugees, they like their huisarts, they like their GPs. They say, you know, that's a nice woman. She listens to you, she has time for you. So they don't want to go to the mental health services because mental health for them is that psychiatric hospital that they know back home from Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan that Jan just talked about, the psychiatric hospital where people are locked up and cuffed, the hands cuffed, and so they don't want to go there. So if you look at these two figures, one of two recognition in our own patients, one in six in refugees, one in three referrals versus one in nine, then you already understand that very few of those people indeed, they really get to the mental health services. Okay, but then, they think they come to Europe and they think they're safe. But again, there's another burden. If you look, what are the factors that create psychological problems? It's the family, it's the endless asylum procedure, it's a lack of work. Those are the most important factors. It's also the, 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 they're homesick, they, they miss their country of origin. But especially a asylum procedure is an enormous problem. We've done research in Holland, we've done research in California. When an asylum seeker has to wait 
more than one and a half year for a decision to get a status, the rate of psychopathology goes up with 50%. That's huge. If you look at, for example, at, at September 11, after the disaster in New York, in about six months, the rates of psychological problems that went up very high, they went back to the baseline level. But among asylum seekers, you often see that it increases. Then among youth, one of the problems is that we drag people around and that more than one dislocation may increase, may double the rate of psychological problems among a refugee, in a refugee child, which is again, a bad thing. I sometimes say, you know, we take better care of our cows than of our refugees. You know, the cows, we know where they are. They have these things in their ears. We have classical music in their stables to increase their milk production. And the asylum seekers, they are there on bad bread, etc. Okay, but what's hopeful that if you look at youth, at youth refugees is that after 15 years, after they arrive in the Netherlands, they do almost as good as indigenous youth. So they come with this enormous backlash, but then they often, they do relatively quite well. Okay, what about treatment? Do we have treatments? Jan already said something about this. Here you see a couple of these guidelines of the World Health Organization and UNICEF, there's the Interagency Standing Committee guidelines here that tells you how to set up interventions either in the West or low-income countries. We have a number of psychological interventions. We have the MH gap, which teaches general practitioners, family doctors, how to deal with nine major psychological and psychiatric problems. And then we also have guidelines for more serious problems. We then have, uh, over the last couple of years, there are interventions called Problem Management Plus for Adults and Ease for Youth, which are very simple interventions that you can train to lay people. You just heard Jan saying, you know, in Iraq there are maybe 20 uh, or 30 psychologists. There's a whole bunch of countries in Africa where there's one psychologist or one psychiatrist for a whole country. So you need to train others to provide interventions. It's what we call task sharing or task shifting. And to do that, you need simple basic interventions that you can easily train. And these are two interventions, Problem Management Plus and Ease, developed by the World Health Organization. Uh, here, the FU in the Netherlands had a big grant, uh, Horizon 2020 grant from the EU, where they tested this in a number of countries with randomized controlled trials. You see them here in the bottom. And it's a short treatment. It's only five sessions of one and a half hours combining counseling problem management with behavioral strategies for stress management, behavioral activation, for example, for people who are depressed and strengthening social supports and coping styles so that people again have a, a, a social safety net. It exists both in an individual format and a group format. There's also a very nice face-to-face -face, uh, app developed in Berlin, where you can use the app in Syrian Arabic for your own diagnosis and for your own treatment, doing this problem management on yourself, meaning that we now have these holistic interventions that are scalable, meaning that we can train many people and supervise them and then kind of extend the program or expand the number of people that we can reach as an oral stain so that we can help more people in all those situations in the world where there are almost no highly trained professionals. So here in this pyramid, this is how we think about public health and public mental health. And we distinguish the population level, the asylum seeker center, and primary care level where the refugees come, the, the mental health services, and then the department of psychiatry. And on each of these levels, we have good, we have good programs. So here we have the integration program, the inburgering with language, with uh, uh, ink acculturation. And then we have a number of preventive programs like the bamboo program, 
We have Team Up for Children, that's practiced by war, child seven rows is another problem. Then we have this PM plus and this ease I just talked about. And then on the higher level in this pyramid, we have a number of psychotherapies, trauma focused, cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, narrative exposure therapy. Also for youth, we have a kid version of this narrative exposure therapy. And of course, all these therapies have to be practiced by people who are culturally sensitive, who have cultural competencies, which is a big issue always in our field, but which is now mostly in the Netherlands. It's taught in the faculties, in the medical faculties, in psychiatry training, in the nursing faculties. If psychology is like behind in the Netherlands, in psychology, it's not standard part of their curriculum. But in general, people know what they talk about, although there's still a lot to do there. So you may say, okay, we have human resources, we have treatments, and why are there then still so few people getting into treatment apart from these things that I mentioned? It's that we also have some structural problems, especially here in the Netherlands. Like, we don't pay the interpreters any longer. We have bad information systems. We often don't know where the asylum seekers go from one place to the others. In contrast to what we always tell in the world, our asylum seekers and refugees, they fall under the Ministry of Justice and not under the Ministry of Justice and Health and Education and Social Affairs. And then we have two major problems, which I see part as part of the Dutch disease, I call it is that we do not find a, a, an organization that's very good in dealing with these issues, we tender them. So we have an open bar armistating every uh, few years and the new organization takes all these refugees on board and they don't know anything about nothing. So they have to learn all from the beginning all over. And there's very complex issues, these issues that we talk about. So, and these organizations, because it's standard, they're more interested in the income and the, and the market share than the well-being of the refugees. Don't, that's one problem. And then another problem is, it's also a very typical Dutch problem, that in those asylum seeker centers that are run by the COA, that there's a local manager and that COA person may decide whether he likes or not these so psychosocial programs. So for example, over the past half year, we had a number of suicides among refugees in the Netherlands. The press was very shocked by that. In Wageningen, there are two asylum seeking centers. One manager of the COA said, well, I don't like these psychological programs. So he didn't do that. And that's why one of the suicides took place. And the other center did have the, the, the programs. And I don't want to say that the, there's a causal relation, but there was a big chance that if that other asylum seeker center that AZC had taken on this program that somebody would have realized that there was a person who was in distress and had a difficult time, they might have prevented the suicide. Okay, so let me get to a couple of recommendations to conclude my talk, because it's already late, I think, we're getting close to nine o'clock. Um, it's important in general that we have active involvement of different ministries of health, of education, of labor, social affairs, economy, etc., and also justice, as Jan has said. We need to help refugees early on with their inburg and their participation, activation, integration, and language acquisition. Strange enough, we often don't allow that in the Netherlands, although employers uh, organizations ask for that. I think we should get, give a bit more uh, attention to prevention and, and also to monitoring the physical and mental state. Long asylum procedures and, and moving children around may increase psychopathology or do increase psychopathology with 50% after one or two years, which is a bad thing. So although this situation has become better over the past years, it's still not solved. I think we need more attention for culturally adapted psychotherapy, as Jan Kieselan also said in his talk. I think we need also interventions for family. 
family. So there is a lack of good family interventions because the family and the, the, there are many tensions in the families when they come here. So young girls from the Middle East going to school, whereas back home in Syria or Iraq, they may be married when they are 13 or 14 years. So the parents here, they are afraid that they get up mixed up with boys, etc. So there's all kinds of tensions in many of these families who have very few good interventions that are applicable for them that we can use to help them. We need to further stimulate cultural competencies of our staff and we need to provide interpreters, both in low and high income countries uh, so these were my, 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 my recommendations. Let me get back one moment to progress and then my talk is finished. When we talk about public health, we have a number of classical A's. We talk about we, whether our services are accessible, whether they are available, whether they are acceptable, whether people can pay for them and whether they provide us adequate uh, and when you look at what we do in the Netherlands, you may say, well, in fact, we do very bad. As I said before, less than 10% gets treatment. And like Procrustes, we have two beds and two standards because the reason why on this amphora, you see that the hero Theseus on the right with his ex, he kills Procrustes on his own bed. And one of the reasons that Theseus was so angry was that Procrustes, he had two beds. So when he took somebody from the road and put them on his bed and he fitted the bed, he just used another bed to cheat. So, and then he was killed. But in a way, that's what we do. We talk about uh, care in the Netherlands that's tailored to uh, the refugees and the asylum seekers but in fact, we do have two standards. So I think we achieved a lot in our country and that applies to a major part of Europe as well, but I think we can do much better. And that was my talk. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you Job, for your very interesting talk. And uh, we should go to a lot of pets then, if I understand you correctly. We should go to it. A lot of pets instead of only two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll ask Jan uh, to come back and unmute. We can have a small discussion uh, between the two very knowledge uh, speakers. And I also have a couple of questions uh, ready, so uh, you can go ahead with those two. Who wants to start? You already know each other, don't you? Jan and Joop. No. We are working together also. No, no, we know each yeah. other from our from by name. I know Jan by name, but we I, Jan, I think we never met, did we? No, not really, no, but uh, of course I know you will work and you are publications and so I follow you very long time for a long time so yes that's a big honor <laughs> no, me too so Remy how do I make this bigger oh yeah now it's fine yes. I have no you are, yes, yes yes thank you and uh, do you want to react on each other's story or would it uh, be a uh, I mean, uh, it was really perfect because both of um, I was more focused in war and war post-conflict um, crisis region, and Job mentioned the special situation of, of the migration and refugees. And I hope we had the same experiences here in Germany. So with refugees regarding PTSD and waiting sometimes for many years for our status. Uh, and the places we are staying is so much horrible and affected, of course, um, uh, the psychological um, situation of, of the people. Even we don't have some screenings, uh, just, just imagine if we have one, one patient which has 
schizophrenia who is living in a, in a camp, in a refugee camp in Germany, uh, nobody, and he's not talking to anyone, and nobody will care on him. And he can stay maybe for one year, two years with the schizophrenia, and nobody will know what has happened to him. Mm. So we don't have really a screening system to know which one people is affected, have some psychological problems, and have a network. And we have a lot of, of course, uh, good staffs and trauma centers. Uh, but then at the same time, it's a financial problem, which is not always supported by the, by the government and by the EU. And uh, just in Germany, like in, in Netherlands, even in 2015, you know more about it, 800,000 refugees came in one, one year. Uh, and uh, according to our studies, at least 20 to 25% uh, fulfill the criteria of PTSD. Uh, can you imagine? This means that in 2015, 200,000 yeah. 200, yeah. uh, refugees with a post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, but we don't have the centers and the doctors, the staff, and the culture-sensitive uh, experts who can do diagnosis and treatment. We have some clinics like my clinic with special cultural sensitive uh, department, but it's of course not enough. So uh, hmm. both, um, uh, both lectures uh, was perfect to, uh, hmm. compare to each other. I think, you, 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 thank you, Jan. I think uh, Maduka, if you don't have a specific question, then I may react to Jan. Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, what, what, what I think is a, a, a huge problem is that, um, like in the Netherlands, uh, we we are training people all over, all the time over the past 30 years. So we have these congresses and we have these books on transcultural psychotherapy and psychiatry. We have often symposia, we had them in Maastricht, we had them in Utrecht and Amsterdam, etc. But as long as the universities, the faculties, the hogescholen, so the nursing and the social work training programs, if they don't have cultural competencies mm -hmm. in their curriculum so that everybody who gets out of the university or out of a whole school, that they know how to deal with a diverse population, you have to, you, it, it's an endless problem. So I think that's a very basic thing, which is quite easy to, to realize. Strange enough here, the medical faculties who are often regarded as conservative, all the faculties have a program for all the medical students on cultural diversity. After a long debate, we got it in all our training programs for the psychiatrists. But as I said, uh, in psychology, it's, it depends very much on the lecturers or one or two professors. And we don't have any professors in the Netherlands any longer on, on who are really specialized in cultural psychotherapy or cultural psychology. We used to have them, but they're, they're, they, they, they are not there any longer. So that's that's a big issue. But, you know, some younger now coming up, uh, but it's one of the problems that we struggle with, yes. And how can we prepare uh, society uh, besides uh, educating the right people uh, in the right way? Uh, for the extra investment that, for instance, refugees need when they try to establish uh, uh, in our country uh, with PhD and traumas uh, and whatsoever. That's one of the questions. Jan, do you want to react to that first? Just, just short, maybe uh, two ways uh, I would recommend it. Uh, one way is, of course, to have a network and as um, you mentioned, we need started at the universities, uh, even social work, psychology, medicine, or people who are somehow related to PTSD and trauma. Uh, otherwise, it will be too late and we will not have enough stuff to be expert and to know how to deal and to, 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 to support. The second way, what uh, we are doing now in Iraq, after 2014, when we take this 1,000 women, uh, most vulnerable women who were in the hand of ISV, uh, we recognize you cannot take all refugees to Europe. This is one reality. And mm. of course, most of them don't want to come to Europe. This is another issue. So they, 
if they have some peace and they're able to live peaceful in the country, they will stay in the country. This is my, uh, my observation. So we started to set up this Institute of Psychotherapy and Psychotraumatology. It's a mass advanced studies. Uh, it's a double qualification. That means they received um, a master in psychotherapy and psychotraumatology. And they, were, they became a licensed psychotherapist like in Netherlands or in Germany, the same criteria. Uh, so mm -hmm. we, uh, we finished now this year with 28 uh, licensed psychotherapists and master. Mm -hmm. are, the condition was they have to live in Iraq. They are not came to Europe because mm -hmm. they know the culture, they know the languages, we don't any, uh, need any mm -hmm. And we adopt the modern way of psychotherapy in their culture. And so this is maybe another way to work also with our experience from Europe, from the US, to work more and uh, train uh, local staff. The local staff, they are able to support and help the, the people. Maybe this are the, the both ways. Uh, I mean, it's very important. Yeah, I very much agree. I think in, in the areas back in Africa and Asia where the wars are often going on. I think the, the big thing is that the few psychologists and psych psychiatrists that are there, they basically have to become trainers, yeah. trainers and supervisors. And that's how they, in fact, they should spend about 80% of their time. And then using these modern tools that we now have this problem management plus or this ease and these similar kind of programs like MHGAP, et cetera, and then train people. I think in the Netherlands and in Germany, and Europe, I think that model often could also help. I think we like in the asylum seeker centers, there are social workers, there's what we call practice supporters. So they're partake almost owners. So they help the doctors in the asylum seeker centers, but also the doctors in the neighborhoods because when people get a status here in the Netherlands, they, of course, they are not longer in the asylum seeking center, but then they have in theory the same care as the Dutch. But again, the GP often doesn't have time to treat those people with these same basic packages like Problem Management Plus and, and, and similar more basic forms of, of prevention of psychotherapy. We could reach many, many more people. And, we, and, and I think we should even train uh, people from, uh, from the culture there, because we get many teachers and nurses and doctors who are in our refugee centers. Mm -hmm. And they are often sitting idle and they offer very smart people, but they are not trained in psychosocial issues. They are trained a bit in psychiatry and they know how to deal with pills, but not with psycho psychotherapy. I think we should also teach them and because they are culturally competent, they come from that culture, they know the culture, they speak the language, and they could much more easily than be trained and help people in the asylum seeker centers when they come out or help people in the community when they have psychological problems. So I think these are some of the directions that we could use to, 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 to alleviate this problem. Because this, this, this very small percentage of seven, eight percent, it was a huge study here by the Social Cultural Plan Bureau two years ago. But I've had, we have done three or four studies and two PhDs even 20 years ago, ago among the Iraqis. We had the same thing. Only six percent of the Iraqis got treatment when they had PTSD or depression in the Netherlands. And when they got treatment, they always got uh, analgetics. So they got aspirin and uh, paracetamol. And that's what, that's how they had to deal with the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's another question of Karen Bayer. Uh, she asks, uh, how can I get the scalable intervention manuals you are talking about in your presentation to help training NGOs in Uganda? Karen, that's very easy. You you click, you do that in two seconds. You go to the website of the World Health Organization, you type in who.com, and then you type in problem management plus, and then you get the manual fully free, which is certified and, and uh, free since about a month. You get at least a group manual with all the training manuals, everything you need 
And I think the individual uh, manual is all, already there as well. Ease is still in the process. Ease is being researched. Uh, there are already, there is a randomized controlled trial. The World Health Organization does not use any intervention, pill or medication, whatever in the world, if there are not two randomized controlled trials. The randomized controlled trial for children with that ease program in Lebanon uh, had to be stopped because of uh, COVID. So that's, uh, there's a delay, but there are other programs you can find. There's a, a, a preventative program, another program, WHO. There's the Seven Roses program. Uh, so you'll find them in the internet. Can you again um, uh, repeat the link? That, then I can type it in the questions and ask. Well, you can uh, just, if you go to Google and you type in who.com, worldhealthorganization.com, and then there's a somewhere search, and then you type in problem management manual or treatment manuals, and then you'll find it. Karen, is that your question? Is it an answer to Karen's question? Absolutely. Uh, then the, one of the last questions, because we are reaching the time uh, limit uh, at this moment, uh, is a very interesting one. It is, uh, you're talking about uh, the, uh, the challenge of cultural taboos and uh, cultural rules. Um, how do you approach a situation of sexual violence as a therapist uh, when it is considered a taboo? And, to, and as uh, Joop also said, uh, it is not clear that uh, it is actually a psychological problem or a person does not want to talk about it. Yeah, maybe I start just uh, from my experiences since 2014, when I was um, uh, working for the German government and you know, went to, to Iraq and uh, examined uh, 1,400 women who were in the hand of IS, and 90, 90%, 99% of them were raped many, many times. Uh, so it was an issue, and uh, there was something they could not hide because everyone knows it. But at the same time, uh, you know, they came from a patriarchal society. In patriarchal society, normally, uh, they would exclude this woman. So uh, we talk with uh, religion leaders, uh, with the political leaders to find a solution to accept this woman. Uh, and they did it actually, which was uh, a change of the paradigm changing. So uh, if, with, if you would follow the old way of culture and religion, so you would not able to, to, to support and to help the woman. Sometimes as a psychotherapist, we are neutral. So we don't belong to any culture. And actually, uh, for me, as a in, in quotation, a good psychotherapist have also no gender. So when I'm doing psychotherapy with a woman, so after a good relationship and trust and confidence, there's no more a problem if I'm a man and she's a woman. So we are talking about even about sexual taboos, but it is our job as a psychotherapist to convince them that it's very normal, very okay. It's a room for you, a special room where we can talk without any borders and any taboos, which will be stay with you and with me and can talk then. Uh, sometimes it's also to, um, as uh, Job mentioned, uh, to invite or to include the family if it's needed. Uh, because this sexual violation, it is not individual, it is collective. And uh, it was easier because everyone knows, the public knows, the family knows. And so we, we invite the family, father, mother, brother, sisters, and talk about the issue, how we can deal with the society, but at the same time, how you can support your sister or your wife. Uh, and this is something in, um, uh, sometimes we as a psychotherapist have, we have the, our own taboos. And sometimes we have to break it. Uh, so uh, when I'm uh, talking with a Turkish woman, I'm saying, oh my God, I cannot talk with her because she will be ashamed. And she always expected, say, if the doctor don't say to me to anything, I will not talk to him. 
about sexual violence. And so sometimes it's up to me in, in uh, traditional cultures, uh, the doctors as well as like psychotherapists have a high level of accept acceptance. Uh, they accept it. Uh, you can talk as a doctor with them without any taboos, but it's up to you sometimes to break these taboos. Uh, this is sometimes the case of supervision uh, to talk how I can open myself without any fear to maybe to be ashamed or to ashamed my patient. So um, it is possible to do that. Sometimes we need time. Uh, just uh, uh, I know from one woman from Syria, she was also raped by, uh, by uh, the Ba'ath regime and uh, soldiers. And uh, in the first five sessions, she was just sitting in front of me and don't talk. But she came every time, on time. And after the five and six session, she said it was good just to sit there and have the feeling someone is there with me and behind me. And with the time she gets uh, trust and confidence and we started to talk about them. Uh, but for me, it was very so as a trained European uh, psychotherapist and behavior therapist and cognitive behavior therapist, it was for me very difficult just to sit there because we have to learn, we have to work, you know, and if you don't work, there's nothing. So uh, this is sometimes- yeah, That would also be a question for me. Well, what do yeah. you do then? Are you just sitting there looking That's, at her or? You know, you cannot believe it. How hard is it to sit 20, 30 minutes silent? Yeah. Don't do anything, just sitting there and wait. But this is sometimes, you know, it's depend on, on your patient individually. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes uh, up to us, if I know the culture, just for example, in the clinics, they came uh, through Muslims through the Ramadan and say, uh, there's no a feast time or Ramadan. I, I don't want to take any, uh, any, uh, any medication, any pills. Uh, so I say, no, no, look, uh, here I have two, uh, the two different kinds of Quran and say they written there if you on travel on if you seek there's prohibited to feast and then say, okay you are right so uh, sometimes we have to know the culture and argue with the culture and this is what I said before in my lecture sometimes they can misuse the culture because we don't know how the culture is and but as a psychotherapist we can ask questions yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, there's there's one last question from Diana King. Uh, we know from the remarkable research of Hans Kelsen with Holocaust uh, child survivors that the period after the genocide is actually the most important sequence concerning the development of complex P, uh, TBS. Uh, do we have to underline that uh, more uh, slash build up a greater uh, awareness for that in order to get more political and financial support for survivors? Beautiful question. Yes. Um, shall I react to that? The issue of transgenerational transmission of trauma is since the work of Kels and other people has has a long tradition. Although there are also some people like the psychoanalyst Lomrans who has said that a lot of the post Second World War literature from psychoanalysis focuses in fact is based on 10 cases that were rewritten all the time. But we now have quite some studies and we have been doing research ourselves in Burundi and um, there are now also interventions, by the way, that there are interventions with parents and children, and there are quite some good interventions where parents and children, they deal with either extreme emotions or they deal with how to discuss the past or they deal with how to uh, survive the past. There's another element to, to this whole issue of transgenerational transmission which has also to do with the previous question of sexual violence, that it's useful to look at rituals. There are many rituals all over the world. There are rituals, for example, in Eastern Africa around women who have been raped, where it's very important that the elderly and the leaders, as Jan said, that they accept that the, the woman is not expulsed from society, that she's not blamed. But there are also rituals 
from the very old time onwards that help families to cope with the trauma. Uh, there are cleansing rituals or healing rituals. And I think in those situations that we discuss, uh, it often is a very good idea to use these rituals to, uh, to help society to overcome the trauma. Another way of dealing with it is a very good example uh, in Rwanda, where people they have made for over a few years, they have uh, made a radio program, a very sophisticated radio program. Most people in the villages, they have the radio not only to talk about perpetrators and compensation, one of the big issues that Jan also talked about, but also to deal with how do you come as a society when there are so many people being killed, like uh, one and a half million in Rwanda or 800,000 in Burundi? What do you do when there are so many people that are traumatized? And how do you try the society to absorb that? And then radio and theater are very good ways also to deal with these issues. Because even if you, if you would have the number of psychotherapies that we have in the Netherlands or Germany, and you would train them anywhere in the world, you still couldn't deal with those massive issues. So you need, you need to go into other forms of interventions beyond psychotherapy and psychology and psychiatry, otherwise you don't get anywhere. So that you kind of reinforce the healing mechanisms that those societies have developed over the centuries. But this is of course a very complex issue, by the way, the person I, I just wrote a chapter about family and war the person may uh, through the organization I can send that chapter to the to the people who are interested in this perfect okay thank you for that beautiful answer um I think we have come to the end uh, I see no more open questions um uh, uh, then I would like to thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed uh, doing this together with you. Uh, normally I would have uh, uh, some flowers to give to you as a present for your effort. It's received yeah, now. Well, it's received per mail. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, send it via mail. <laughs> your joyful smile is enough, is enough for tonight. You know? yeah. <laughs> ah, that is very sweet of you. Well, it was really a pleasure and it was really a, a, a very nice discussion indeed. I hope to do this more often, uh, maybe in our next uh, convention together, maybe the live one. That would also be nice. Uh, I wish you a lot of uh, pleasure and luck and uh, everything else with the work, beautiful work you are doing. Thank you. And have a wonderful evening. And, and let's hope the, the elections will turn out in the mm -hmm. right way. Yeah. Maduka, before you go to the election, yeah. uh, <laughs> may, 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 may I thank you for your excellent moderating work. And I thank wish to thank Jan for his very, very interesting talk. Jan, it was a pleasure to meet you, you. even yeah. by Zoom. Uh, I also discovered, Jan, a nice yeah. sight of Zoom is that I could read your tables while I was sitting on my computer. Okay. If we would have a live audience, I would have been sitting there and saying, oh, oh these are interesting figures. But now I could understand that. So, but it was very nice to, to, to meet you and to have you talk listen to you so thanks a lot manduka you as well and of course the organizers thank you yeah thank okay you. thank you and thanks yeah. also for the audience yeah yeah bye bye, bye, -bye everyone bye bye, bye. bye. bye.